the US is not just negotiating TTIP, the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, but it's also negotiating TPP, the trans-Pacific partnership. So the US is trying again to isolate countries like China and Russia by doing a deal with Vietnam, with all the Latin American countries, Australia, etc., etc. And President Obama had won the fast track authority, special powers to be able to negotiate these deals earlier this year. And the new deadline that they're trying to end TTIP negotiations is at the end of this year, and next year, 2016. So it means that the current 12 month period is absolutely decisive for TTIP. Before we get to TTIP, this is my final slide, there is something else. And I'm very really glad we have a, a, a colleague from Canada who's come here as well, so this is particularly here for you. One of the first challenges that we have is that the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement between EU and Canada will come first, before TTIP. The negotiations of this already finished September last year, and the text is currently being prepared in this process of legal scrubbing, which means that it's being prepared as a legal text. It then will be translated so that it can be ratified in each country. And just to give you again a little understanding of how little transparency, how little democracy there is, we don't know when it will happen. But one of our friends has got a friend who works in the translation department of the European Commission. And she was having coffee with her friend, and she says, have you had this um, CETA text yet in your department? And the friend who works at the European Commission translation department said, no, we haven't seen it yet. And that's the first thing we heard as to where it is in the process. Because we know it will take at least six months to translate into all the 24 languages of the European Union, and then it gets sent back to each of the member states to check that the translation is okay. So we still have time. TTIP, uh, CETA is TTIP's big brother. It's just as dangerous because it includes the same powers of ISDS. And remember, we're not really so scared of Canadian country, companies here. You know, Canadian companies. Who can name a Canadian company? Not you, because you know that. But who can name a Canadian company? You know, people usually say, oh, Air Canada. You know, who can name a... It's very difficult. So we're not scared of Canadian companies. But 80% of all US companies that operate in Europe have got offices in Canada. So they can still use all of these things. Our challenge, therefore, now is to use CETA for a first rejection of the European Parliament. A rejection because we believe that the European Parliament should say no to CETA, and it's possible for us to build the numbers on that. We can discuss that a bit more after now. But it means that we have an opportunity in the next year to have another victory on this. And that's because this is, if you want to have more information, our website, and there's also a good website called bilaterals.org, which can give you the same sort of things. But I just wanted to end by saying again, like I started, we can win. We can win against these deals. When we have had big international campaigns against them in the past, we have defeated them. This campaign on TTIP and CETA is the biggest pan-European campaign on a trade deal that there's ever been. The European Commission says there's never been anything like this. It's incredible that there are so many people who are coming out and are giving so much anger and opposition to this deal. It's fantastic that we now have this opposition in every single member state of the European Union. In Central Europe, in Eastern Europe, in Southern Europe, in West Europe, in North Europe. Maybe not Denmark, but anyway, most countries, the, the Scandinavians are very, very pro-free trade. They're a bit of a problem. But together with this pan-European movement, if we put pressure on all of our politicians one by one, we can defeat each other. And I hope that I have explained why it is so important for us to do so. This 
is really a struggle for the future of our societies. Do we want to have a future where all of our beliefs, all of our hopes, all of our aspirations for a better society, for a safe environment, for public health, all of those are second place to profit? Or do we want to turn the tables so we can build a better Europe, a social Europe, and an environmentally sustainable Europe for tomorrow? That's the choice, and that's why we must defeat TTIP. Thank you. Děkuji moc Johnovi za jeho prezentaci a nyní máme bohatých 45 minut. Tak neváhejte, vzdejte svoji příležitosti. Já bych vás poprosil, abyste mluvili vždycky do mikrofonu, který vám rád předám, abyste se představili a svůj komentář, otázku, dotaz formulovali jasně, stručně, výstižně, aby to bylo srozumitelné jak nám, účastníků, tak i tlumočnicím, které mají tu náročnou práci překládat celou dnešní konferenci.
think tanks have done, show that there will be very negative effects for countries like Turkey or Mexico or the West African countries, which are closely linked to the economies of Europe or the USA. Because they will see that as there's more trade between the US and Europe, they will see their trade displaced. They will see their trade lessened. Whether that's true or not, we don't know, but certainly that is the, 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 the key demand from the European and the US side. But what's interesting here is to think back 20 years to the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA. NAFTA was the agreement in 1994 between the US, Canada and Mexico. And again, the promise to the working people, to the labor unions of the USA, was that NAFTA would be the economic boost, which would give more trade and more jobs. In fact, Bill Clinton, you remember Bill Clinton? He promised the trade unions and the working people of the USA hundreds of thousands more jobs as a result of NAFTA. Exactly the opposite happened. They now know that as a direct result of NAFTA, there was a loss of one million net jobs which went out of the USA. They went, some of them, to Mexico. They lasted two years in Mexico and then they went to China. And also, in Mexico, they lost two million jobs because the campesinos, the peasants, were brought into direct competition with the US agricultural giants. And so they wiped out food security in Mexico. Mexico had always had a surplus in food production, wiped out by NAFTA. So again, all the promises that somehow TTIP will create the economic stimulus for more jobs, this is just nonsense. In the European Union and the US, we've gone back to our government and to the European Commission again and again and again. And we've said to them, you know that these are false promises. You know that this idea of an economic boom for everybody is false from the historical record and it's even false from your own calculations. And they've said, you're probably right, but it's good for business and that's why we're doing it. Dobrý den, já jsem Monika Hořiní a jsem redaktorkou levicového deníku Halo Noviny. Už se dlouhodobě zabýváme problematikou TTIP. Tak mě zajímá, jestli budete, pane Hilary, zde v České republice lobovat proti TTIP i mezi českými politiky. Vy jste upozornil na významné hlasování nebo významnou skupinu politiků a to socialistů nebo sociálních demokratů a ti jsou v České republice v vládě máme sociálně demokratického premiéra. Tedy jestli budete zde na vaší misi v České republice hovořit i s politiky českými a to tedy především s těmi, kteří mohou změnit názor na té TIP, jestli je budete varovat před těmi nebezpečnými, které jste zde zmíněli. Děkuji. Thank you for the question. Um, we usually leave the lobbying and the campaigning of national politicians to the national platform, because I think the national platform knows much better than we know the political sensitivities and the political levers that you can use. They know the, the points, the pressure points to push. I'm totally happy to meet with any of the Czech politicians who would like to meet with us, definitely. And it's interesting, having read about the, the, the flavor of the Czech political spectrum and its vision of the European Union, it's very interesting. Because it's, it's not the same as in many other countries of, of let's say, even Central Europe. It's, but I was, I was lucky enough to be in Poland. And in Poland, they have a very, very almost an uncomplicated, positive view of the European Union. I think the Czech Republic obviously has a much more developed, a more sophisticated, a more nuanced understanding of the situation of the European Union. A little bit like in the UK, 
Whereas, you know, we are going to be offered a referendum in the next two years as to whether or not we should leave the European Union. And there is a 50-50 split. You know, it's very unclear where it will go. So anyway, I'm, I'm totally happy to be able to, to, to speak to any politician in the Czech Republic. But I think you'll find that Jan and the other colleagues who actually run the No TTIP platform here have a much stronger understanding of exactly how to put the pressure on. Jenom možná Moniku, pro Moniku na doplnění, když se setkáme v Brně s zastupiteli Brna Střed. Tam, tam máme jinak. Vydávání české politiky je ohlížet poměrně, protože z té zkušenosti, kterou jsme zatím měli, tak buď o té věci vůbec nic nevědí, to znamená neví, neví co po nich chceme, anebo jsou pro té TDP, takže se s námi nechtějí bavit. A takže, takže ta situace je poměrně komplikovaná, ale určitě na lobování před českými nebo s českými politikami počítáme a budeme v tom dál pokračovat. Určitě o tom bude i nějaká další akce nebo nějaké vyjádření zase dáme. Dobrý den, jmenuji se Jiří Bezák, zastupuji iniciativu Čas na změny. Chci se vás optat, jestli sdílíte názor některých filozofů, jako je třeba Skomsky. Jeden názor jsem takový zajímavý slyšel ohledně americké demokracie, která je v podstatě nejrafinovanější diktaturou mamonu a biznisu a peněz hlavně. Myslíte si, že svět, který je podobný pyramidovým hrám, kdy na vrcholku pyramidy jsou Spojené státy americké a jejich lobby, jejich Rockefellerové a tak dál, kteří jsou loutkaři a tahají za nitky a ty loutky Miss Obama, Merklova, Olán a podobně, řídí ten svět svým způsobem do záhuby, jsou schopni vyvést svět z budoucí světové krize, protože já mám obavu, že ta krize teprve bude gradovat. Děkuji za odpověď. Yeah, I think it's a very it's a very good question and a very strong point because we need to think now about a long-term project. I think that the TTIP and CETA they do not just represent a, a strategy for the, the present time, but this is about re-engineering society for the future. It's about trying to re-engineer our societies and our economies for the long-term benefit of transnational capital. It's as if Milton Friedman was now the one in charge, pulling all the strings. And I think it's important for us not to think about our governments somehow being victims here. Angela Merkel and all of the other strong governments of Europe, they are not victims somehow being captured by the big corporations. They are willing allies. They are willing partners in this program of opening up to transnational capital. And is this any way to face the next crisis? No. It's 100% the example of how we got into the crisis in the first place. The idea of allowing markets to operate free of any control, operate without free of any limits, that is exactly the same sort of recipe, the same background for the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. So economic crisis, we will have another one because they keep on repeating exactly the same problems. But of course now, we also have an ecological crisis, which is even greater than the economic crisis. And the ecological crisis that we face is because the natural world has got limits. The natural world has limits and boundaries. And we know that we have already crossed some of those limits and some of those boundaries. Capitalism can have no limits. Capitalism must expand in order to survive. It must continue expanding. It must find new markets. When it has saturated the existing markets, it needs to expand to new markets. 
And that's why we still have this crazy trade across the world. I can only give you an example from Britain. Britain, my country, exports 100,000 tons of pork every year. Britain imports 100,000 tons of pork every year. Exactly the same thing. The ships go past each other in the sea. And this is the sort of crazy ecological nightmare for us. We think, why, is this, why, are, we doing, why are we buying apples from New Zealand? We have perfectly good apples. For our logic, this is crazy. But for the logic of capitalism, it's great. And that is where we have a more profound challenge. That's why for us, the battle about TTIP isn't just about one trade deal. It's a much bigger challenge to use TTIP to make people think about the economic future that they want to have. So I agree with you entirely. So I would like to have another question maybe related to your society and people who are, who are members of, of those protests because if I'm looking to the auditorium I don't see so many young people. I work for university, I was dean for faculty for a longer time. Now I'm not in education area anymore. But sometimes I have some visits there, I have a lot of friends. And they are really worried to tell people or tell students the bad truth. So they are completely ideological oriented. And I see this also in our, this is my feeling, I, I see this in our society. There is, there is a no interest of young people to be more involved in those processes. Maybe there are some exceptions. Like here I see some younger. Younger guy as well, and he's uh, he's really interested in, since his uh, area of studies. But I see there is not so much people in the young generation that are involved to, to this. If you ask somebody, nobody knows what TT, uh, TTAP is, and uh, this was uh, this question was related what was said here about the politician. So our politicians, some of them, they immediately went, went from the school to politics and they are completely out of, of this information. So my question is how it is in the UK? Well, I can see quite a few young people. There are many people who are young at heart and many people who are still young in, in, in their age. But, but it's, a, it's a really good point. I mean, I think this is also a question for politics more generally because if politics continues to reproduce the same patterns and the same methods of the past, it doesn't really provide a channel of, of political engagement for young people. I think this is certainly what we see. If I go along to one of the old trade union meetings in one of the sort of old industrial parts of the UK, it will be mainly people like me who have grey hair. And so, you know, it isn't exciting for a new generation. But we have managed to have a lot of new type of meetings and, 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 and events which are not based on the same old approaches of looking into political philosophy, for example. And these have been very, very successful. We have, for example, um, in relation to the climate change issue, we had a, a very, very good, interesting session in London where 1,200 people turned up to the meeting. And I would say 90% of that 1,200 people were under the age of 30. Because it was not a traditional political meeting, but it was more, it had comedians, it had political activists, it had Naomi Klein, who could speak through a, um, a, a Skype connection with Canada. It had, it had a different flavor to it. And I think if we can provide that different flavor, then people do get engaged. In the UK, certainly, there are a lot of students who go on the streets. Just this week, there was another big demonstration um, with students on the streets, quite, quite 
vivid, you know, there was a lot of fighting and a lot of, of anger because of the government crackdown. I think it's a real challenge for us, but what's interesting for me is that the TTIP work has actually drawn out a new generation of people because it's not just saying the old type of politics, it's actually saying there are new things here. And the climate change stuff is one which I think is really, really important to bring people up because for the youth, perhaps casting the political debate in terms of a left-right debate, that feels old for them. But casting it in terms of other more profound hopes for the future, that maybe works a little bit better in, in the UK. But I don't know what it's like here in the Czech Republic so much, or in Slovakia or any of the other countries. Já, když slyším 
poslouchal nebo problematiku, který moc nerozumím, tak rád bych slyšel taky druhou stranu. A moje otázka je možná, že ne, na žena, na pořadatele, jestli také zvali nějaké zástupce, kteří by tu PIP podporovali. A my jsme tu konferenci záměrně koncipovali jako argumenty proti TTIP a dopad, negativní dopad na střední a východní Evropu právě proto, protože česká média dělají pravý opak, to znamená snaží se prodat TTIP jako to nejlepší, co nás může potkat, stejně jako většina ministrů politiků. Proto jsme se rozhodli tu konferenci dělat trošku jako protiváhu proti těm těm tvrzením a argumentům. A z toho důvodu je to postavené takhle. A pokud chcete najít argumenty pro DTIP, tak vám doporučuji, nedoporučuji stránky Ministerstva průmyslu obchodu, tam je celá sekce o, o DTIP, stejně tak stránky Evropské komise, tam taky najdete vlastně samou chválu. Takže těch zdrojů, ve kterých najdete, a najdete ty argumenty pro DTIP, je celá řada. A je mi jasné, že zajímavá je ta konfrontace, a to možná dojde, nebo to možná dojde ještě v debatě, protože pokud nejsou mezi námi a zatím, tak aspoň podle registrace byly přihlášeni dva zástupci Ministerstva průmyslu a obchodu na konferenci. A tak jsem čekal už po nové přednášce, že byly nějaký, nějaká ruka, která začne obhajovat TTIP, zatím se nestal, tak uvidíme si po obědě třeba. A k tomu dojde v některém z dalších panelů a uvidíme. I just want to add one small, again, another apology on my part, because the British Embassy in Prague is also conducting its own propaganda battle, and it's now producing little videos in Czech to tell you how great TTIP will be for the Czech people. And this is ridiculous. It, is, it could be worse. The, Czech, the, the, the UK Embassy in Warsaw, in Poland, ran a competition. And the competition was for students, Polish students, to write an essay in English explaining how good TTIP would be for Poland. And the prize for the competition was not 10,000 euros or a visit to Disney World. The prize was to visit Brussels and meet with the UK government officials in Brussels, which strikes me as being a very, very bad prize in the year. But I do want to say, I mean, one thing perhaps in relation to the, the argument which comes from the other side, I think you're absolutely right, it's important for us to know their arguments as well. A lot of the propaganda they put out is very, very cheap and very shallow propaganda. And we have pushed back and we have got rid of it. But the more profound issue is why they think that something which is good for business is therefore, ipso facto, good for people. And this is a much deeper crisis of perhaps the, the late capitalist societies in which we live. This idea that they will automatically say that what is good for business is good for society. And we've had exactly this challenge with our government officials. We've said to them, how can you do this when you know all of the problems it will bring? And they say, because it's good for business. If it's good for business, it's good for us. Karel Říčka, tři otázky. I když je mi jasné, že nejste asi odborníkem na ústavní právo v České republice, ale ústavní právo funguje asi ve všech státech Evropské unie. Jaké jsou možnosti podání nějaké ústavní stížnosti nebo prostě nějakého ústavního protestu? proti tomu, jak se smlouva dojednává, respektive proti tomu, jak bude ratifikována. Je už jisté to, že ji budou ratifikovat Národní parlament? To je první otázka. Druhá. Kdo jsou přirození naši partneři v boji proti TTIP? Kteří o tom třeba nevědí? Jestli jsou to střední podnikatelé, jestli jsou to nějaké profesní skupiny, 
které zatíží v nějakém klamu. Jakým způsobem je oslovit? A třetí otázka se týká toho principu předběžné, respektive následné bezpečnosti. Čím to je? Že v Americe platí zásada následné bezpečnosti v ekonomice, ale pohledně sledování internetu, šmírování, sledování občanů. Big brother. Je tam předběžná bezpečnost. Jste sledovat, aniž jste něco udělal. Jak to? Proč? Proč mě jste sledovat, až teprve, když jste zločinstvá? Jak to, že to je dopředu? Děkuji. Děkuji. Na první otázku, jste pravdě. Já nevím nic o tom, jak jsem vzpůsobí Čech konstitucí. I also come from one of the very, very few countries in the world which has no written constitution. So the UK, we have no written constitution, so everything is okay. Except for us, the key point is that we have, as our constitutional principle, is the sovereignty of parliament. So for us, we have no written constitution, but the sovereignty of parliament is 100% our constitutional guarantee of democratic rule. And this is the thing which is really contravened. I, I know that in some other countries, particularly again Germany, where they have a very strong belief in their constitutional right, they, 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 they are doing work on this. Also, the relationship between the treaty on the functioning of the European Union. So the actual European Union constitutional principles and particularly the investment court system. So it's possible that there are ways through that. Also we know it's possible in some countries to hold a referendum on these issues. Again, you cannot put any trust in these type of constitutional principles. If you think back to the Lisbon Treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, one country was allowed a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty. That country was Ireland. And Ireland voted no. What did the European Commission do? Said, vote again. It wasn't a referendum, it was an exam. It was a test. And you got the test wrong, so you need to vote again. So, you know, they can always change the rules whenever they feel like it. But is it certain that it will come to national parliaments to ratify? On TTIP, we would say it's 99% certain. There's a, there's a particular form of words and a form of, of, of elements inside a trade deal which turn a trade deal from being exclusive EU competence into being what they call a mixed agreement. And a mixed agreement must come to the national parliaments for ratification. We believe 99% that TTIP will come to national parliaments for ratification. With CETA, the EU Canada deal, we'd say about 80-90% it will come as well. The second question, who are the partners that we have who don't already form part of our movement? But what's good? and um, this has not always been the case, is that the trade unions, they are part of our movement. In the past, sometimes the trade union structures of Europe were not on our side. They thought, okay, free trade is good, maybe if we can get more exports, we can get more jobs. But now for TTIP, the trade unions have said, we recognize this is a big problem. And for CETA, even at the European level, the European Trade Union Confederation, has now come out 100% against CETA, the EU-Canada deal. And they are very, very skeptical of TTIP as well. But your question is a really good question. What about the other forces? The small enterprises, the small and medium-sized enterprises, the local entrepreneurs. And this is exactly the sort of constituency that we want to contact. Again, I'm sorry to keep referring to Austria and Germany, but they have done a lot of this work already. In Austria and in Germany, they have got websites and lists of small businesses who have come out against TTIP. 
KMU gegen TTIP in Austria and Germany, thousands of small businesses. They even have some of the supermarkets are taking out full page adverts in the newspapers saying that they do not believe that TTIP will be good for the future of their country. And we also in Britain are launching a new campaign of business against TTIP because business needs to say to the European Commission, okay, if you're a really big business and you want to open up California or Mississippi or I don't know, then maybe TTIP's good for you. But 99% of our businesses do not wish to open up California. They just wish to survive. They just wish to continue just about surviving here. So they will be threatened. And then the third question, the precautionary principle. <laughs> How is it possible that the US has its own precautionary principle when it comes to listening to everybody across the whole world? Well, interestingly for us, the US position in terms of the internet freedoms and digital privacy is actually fully 100% the same as with all of the other protections. Because what they want to do is they want to give Amazon and Google and Facebook and all of the other ones full access to the private data of all European people because they consider that data to be a commodity. In the same way they consider water to be a commodity or food to be a commodity or health to be a commodity, they consider that private online data is also a commodity. And that is why it's so important for us to recognize that inside TTIP there is a chapter which deals with intellectual property and access to data. So this is again another reason why there are lots and lots of other groups who work on digital privacy in Europe, who work against TTIP. Obviously the US would benefit from having more access to the private data of people and to their online activity, because if Google finds out everything that you're doing and tells the US government everything that you're doing, then it's great for them, because it means that Google gets rich and the US government gets all of the information it needs to control our lives. So I think for them it's a win-win situation, and for us it's a lose-lose situation. Já jsem byl na jedné debatě, kterou organizovalo Ministerstvo průmyslu a obchodu spolu se zastoupením jeho českého kraje. A tam byli zástupci malého a středního biznesu, zástupci podniků. A byli tam tedy představitelé panelu a vybraní zástupci malých a středních podniků z jeho českého kraje. A myslím, že pro nás je vlastně potěšující jedna skutečnost jaký byl naprostý propad mezi těmi zástupci a těmi skutečnými podnikateli. Protože zástupci byli stoprocentně pro a podnikatelé řekli, že jim to nikdy, nikdo nic neřekl a že to, co slyší, jsou nesmysly a že rozhodně, rozhodně nejsou pro takovouhle nekazkou. To byla jako velmi, velmi, velmi pozitivní zpráva, protože určitě ta politická reprezentace tady z Prahy, která jezdí po různých krajích, tak má jasno, Otázka je, co ti skuteční podnikatelé a, a na, na místě, co tady s nimi. No a druhá věc, samozřejmě, když už změnil odbory, tak to samozřejmě nemůžu vynechat. České odbory se vlastně posouvají velmi pozitivním směrem. My dneska máme odborový svaz pracovníků zdravotní a sociální péče a odborový svaz pracovníků školství. A naposledy, a to je úplně největší asi bomba, a odborový svaz Kovo, největší, největší průmyslový svaz v České republice a všechny tři jsou proti TTIP nebo, nebo říkají, že se jim zásadně nelíbí některé, některé části a odlejí proti tomu něco dělat. Dochodem zástupci Kovo byli taky před několika týdny na té velké čtvrtmilionové demonstraci v Berlíně, kterou jste možná zaznamenali v médiích, nebo možná ne, protože se o ní moc nemluvil. Ale v každém případě tam byla a myslím, že Měl pozitivní efekt i na české odboráře a my s nimi určitě budeme dál pracovat. Dana Pavlíčková, já to všechno vidím tedy jako začarovaný kruh. Na střední neuropatolog a profesor Koukolík říká, 
že prostě někteří lidé se rodí bez center svědomí a odpovědnosti. A zdá se, že právě takovýto lidé v současnosti ovládají Evropu a vlastně tak se ta Evropa řídí do záhuby. Lidé nejsou informovaní, u nás tedy jako určitě ne, protože naprostá většina médií buď od té IP nepíše, anebo no, zvíš, ne. tak bude psát tedy jako pozitivní. My musíme využívat především alternativní zdroje, jako jsou parlamentní listy, jako je teda a třeba Nová republika a podobně. A tak mě by tedy jako prostě zajímalo, třeba jakým způsobem pracujete vy, aby veřejnost ve Velké Británii byla informována, co teda to skutečně TTIP znamená. Yeah, it's a very good question because we face a lot of the same challenges. The, the mainstream media in the UK is very similar. Partly because they don't really know about it and so they don't really put any effort into it. So if the government says two plus two is five, they say, well, you know, then the government, maybe two plus two is five. So, you know, it is hard for us. We have formed a coalition an um, alliance of all the groups who work on TTIP in the UK. So the trade unions, uh, the campaigns group from the left, the environmental groups, the public health groups, the digital rights groups, the youth groups. And we meet regularly in order to try to think how we can get this information out to the more general public. We hold, we hold a lot of public meetings, you know, Every night in one part of the UK there will be a public meeting on TTIP with lots of speakers and debates about it. We produce our own newspaper on TTIP. There have only been three issues so far, but we give out thousands and thousands of newspapers saying what is the news on TTIP, because there are lots of people who have come forward with it. Really importantly, we're trying to produce more videos, more films, Again, I'm afraid the UK Embassy has produced its own film here in Czech. You need to keep producing more and better films than they produce. So we try to produce lots of interesting stuff. For example, we try to put stuff out which is not about TTIP, but it starts with something that people care about. Nobody cares about a trade deal, but people do care about their children. So our film, which we're trying to do, we're finalizing at the moment, is a film about a woman whose daughter died at the age of six by eating a beef burger, a burger which had E. coli contamination. It's a, it's a contamination inside the burger. And she is saying, my daughter died because we didn't have the same sort of protection that we need to protect us against poisoning in our food. Under TTIP, the European Union is asking to, to cancel all inspections of imported meat from the USA. And Brussels, the European Commission, is saying we want to get rid of all independent inspections of meat inside Europe as well. They want it to be self-regulation, so they want to give the, the, the power to the corporations themselves in order to police it. Now, if you start by saying, people, saying to people, the European Commission wants to phase out independent inspection of meat in favor of self-regulation, everybody's going to say, that's dead boring. But if you start by saying, this woman lost her daughter at the age of six, because that protection was not there. And now they're trying to take that protection away. It makes it real. And that's why for us, we're talking about the jobs. It's your job. You will be unemployed. Your children will be unemployed. Your children will go to hospital. When they go to hospital, they won't be able to afford it. So that there are lots of very clever ways in which you can make it better. There is maybe, there's a nice um, two minute video which a group in Belgium produced, which is called TTIP Day One, which maybe we can show later, which is a nice way of saying to people, this is what the reality of life will be. When you have no rights, 
and all the power has gone to big business. But I agree with you, we need to make it real to people. We need to make it so they recognize what TTIP will mean in the future. And that's very much what we try to do with all of the other groups. <coughs> with the other groups we work with. Já mám vydáno přijel bych jakousi skepsi nad iluzema levice a na druhé straně nad zklamáním potom, že jednotlivé akce jsou jaksi